Good afternoon. My name is Tejasuni Rajodhri and welcome to today's lecture on death penalty, which I shall try to keep brief, concise and to the point. So the reason I am getting into this topic is that death penalty is a topic which is often asked in judicial service examinations in mains as well as in the interview and then it is also important for LLB and also LLM if you are in criminal law specialization this topic is very important so without further ado let's get into it see firstly death penalty is an extreme form of punishment which is the reason why it faces such massive backlash and criticism from every corner of the world which includes jurists and uh, human rights organizations human rights activists and international humanitarian law so firstly we shall get into the subtopic of the history of death penalty and why the reasons why it has been used or rather invoked um, throughout history and even today it is still invoked so as far as the historical perspective is concerned see death penalty has been in use to punish criminals especially the ones that are committing heinous crimes and you know even thieving or things like that and it has been seen in use in ancient Rome ancient India and all the ancient civilizations basically and also in medieval India medieval England and basically every other legal system and it is used even today right although uh, there are several countries that have abolished uh, that penalty as a form of punishment so first of all the two reasons why they are used the two very common reasons one is the deterrent effect that this death penalty has see earlier back way back death penalty was given in public right there were public executions like public hangings and uh, publicly executed in guillotine or maybe publicly shot uh, different kinds of um, public executions so back then the idea was that when the other people they watch these people being punished these criminals being punished it would deter them from committing these crimes of course today you can say that well today public executions are no longer the norm so what happens today how is the deterrent theory still in effect today basically it is said that um, believed that the same thing happens where people are deterred from committing these crimes because they know that the death penalty is going to be there and the other form of deterrence that is there is it is believed that a person who is beyond any kind of reformation because of the gravity of the crime that he has committed the depravity of the crime that he has committed uh, this person is by way of death penalty deterred from committing any further crimes because if he is not on death penalty he might be maybe released on parole or and then he might go commit some other crime which sometimes they do happen and the second reason for death penalty is the retributive justice theory according to this it is believed that a person who takes the life of one has no right to live it is a kind of a vengeance that is socially and legally controlled and it its appeal its public appeal was there back in the day and it's there today as we can see in many different cases for example um, let's say during the Delhi gang rape case um, it was seen the public outcry the public um, calling for death penalty it was seen so it's still in effect the that reason still holds now let's talk about the how different before we talk about India how the other countries have treated death penalty um, firstly the United States of America right so in US um, 
death penalty is currently observed by 35 different states and it's abolished in 19 states um, and death penalty is awarded for different homicide related crimes and um, even contract murder and it includes drug trafficking like wherever homicide might happen death penalty is there so in a landmark case in a landmark judgment the u.s supreme court in um, just hold on the u.s supreme court in foreman was the state of georgia 1972 held that death penalty should be outlawed because it is an anachronism and it is degrading to human dignity and unnecessary in modern life and by a 5-4 five, five, majority the Supreme Court held that it is violative of the 8th amendment of the US Constitution and um, back then Mr. Justice Douglas speaking on behalf of the bench had observed that um, in most cases where death penalty is given it is irregular and um, usually the people who are given to award the penalty are the minorities the ones that cannot fight for themselves and so the balance is the, the scale is tipped there right it is very arbitrary in nature now following this judgment of the u.s supreme court as many as 35 states in the u.s they reformed their laws uh, and you know brought more safeguards when it came to death penalty and several states also abolished the death penalty however owing to the rising crime rates they had to bring it back and presently only 19 states have banned the death penalty in the uk the first person um to raise a crusade to you know to protest against death penalty was the criminologist Beccaria and that was back in 1764 and since then uh, the laws of UK they have gradually uh, developed into you know in the early 19th century there were like 200 crimes uh, that were awarded the death penalty but gradually I think in um, 1969 right and in 1969 finally in UK the death penalty was abolished um, coming to the other countries um, for example in Australia death penalty is not abolished but it is to be used sparingly right in the rarest of the rare cases and it is given for murder and rape and then there are countries like France Germany Scandinavia um, Netherlands Denmark where the death penalty is abolished and the reason that they give is that the people are not afraid of death penalty they are afraid of police efficiency so the problem is the issue that should be uh, targeted in order to reduce crime rates is police efficiency because in most cases people know that they're not going to get caught and in the countries where death penalty has been abolished it also included Sri Lanka at one point but then they brought it back after one of the prime ministers were murdered in 1962 the United Nations they held a survey and uh, in that survey it was seen that abolishing death penalty did not make the crime rates in these countries rise in any way it did not affect the crime rates of these countries at all and this is where the argument comes in that death penalty has absolutely zero effect in reducing crimes which is the uh, the deterrence effect that is talked of and it has no effect so and that is one of the main arguments which we will look at in the next part of this lecture now let look, let's look at the arguments for and against death penalty firstly there are two terms here the people who argue for death penalty are called retentionists because they aim to retain the death penalty and the people who argue against the death penalty are called abolitionists because they are in favor of abolishing the death penalty so 
the retentionists they argue that the very fact that uh, you know people who are on death row they you know they appeal for pardon or uh, you know an alternative sentence let's say like a life life imprisonment um the very fact that they do this is proof that death penalty does have a deterrence effect right and it also serves as fair retribution that you are committing crimes you are uh, you know uh, affecting the society by your actions and so there is retribution for that further some penologists also believe that death penalty is not as cruel as it is made out to be because uh, in death penalty the due to the uh, recent you know different kinds of uh, executions that are uh, done like for example lethal injections um, it is very fast it happens within a matter of minutes so it is not as cruel as it is made out to be and that in comparison let's say a life imprisonment is far more cruel because a person has to live their entire life let's say and that could be 30 years 40 years they could they would have to leave live the rest of their life uh, with the tag that it, first of all in, in prison and with the tag that they have committed a heinous crime and there is no coming back from that now the abolitionists they argue first of all it's that it's against human rights that it is it brutalizes the human nature and that there is strong evidence like the one i was talking about previously in the uh, 1962 un uh, survey that was conducted that there is no proof there is no statistical proof to show that um, the death penalty has indeed the abolition of death penalty um, will le lead to an increase in crimes and that death penalty indeed has a deterrent effect and additionally as far as human rights is concerned um, according to the uh, articles 3 and 5 of the UDHR which is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, according to these this as well uh, they say that death penalty is violative of human rights and additionally um, it is also said that um, many murders that happen in the heat of the moment and they're not premeditated they're not planned and um, in these cases giving a death penalty is not desirable because it just uh, it wouldn't have it is inappropriate because the offender does not deserve it because it the offender did so in the heat of the moment and there is scope for reformation right so the abolitionists they lean more towards the reformative theory of justice now there's another argument that the abolitionists give that is the irreversibility of the death penalty that once uh, let's say an innocent man has been awarded the death penalty and um, he has been hanged in that case it is it cannot be reversed right and in in case of injustice it just simply cannot be reversed to this the reten retentionists they argue that the irreversibility first of all the irreversibility of punishment itself is not just applicable in uh, cases where death penalty is given but in all other cases of imprisonment because let's say a person has been imprisoned for life uh, that too is irreversible in case of carrying out of justice but again the abolitionists in that case would say that well they can always appeal and <coughs> they can be let out but the banter still continues about the irreversibility but the retentionists also say that as far as irreversibility is concerned especially in let's say in india there is enough safeguards to uh, so that the death penalty is not awarded to just to an innocent man so that you know the death penalty is awarded to the person or persons who are deserving of it and there are seven points uh, which ensure this uh, 
the death penalty or the trial which would end up result in death penalty would um, be you know accurate and it would not administer injustice in the name of justice first point is that the death penalty is to be used only in the rarest of the rare cases and this was developed in and this was uh, stressed by the supreme court in uh, bachchan singh versus state of punjab right the second uh, and there are more uh, developments in this area but i'll come to that later the second part is that um, the second point is that the court uh, before awarding the death sentence uh, according to the section 354 subsection 3 of the crpc um, has to record the special reasons as to why the death penalty is being awarded uh, the third point is that the Uh, there is a pre-sentence pre hearing, uh, which is as a right given to a person who has committed a crime. Um, you know that can be the punished with death penalty, and that is given in section 235, subsection 2 of the CRPC, and this gives him an opportunity to put forward the plea for an alternative punishment uh, of um, life imprisonment other than uh, death penalty. Right. in the point 4 um there is a it's said that the cumulative effect of the provisions of the of earlier two provisions of the crpc it individualizes the death penalty uh, awarding the sentencing process and it's that's why there is very little scope of uh, error in judgment the fifth point is that the sentence after it is awarded the death sentence after it is awarded by the court of sessions has to be um, sent for a permission to the uh, high court under sections 366 to 370 of the crpc and all the evidence uh, relating to the case have ha also has to be sent and additionally the high court can also uh, you know call for inquiry and additional evidence in the interest of justice the sixth point is that um, there's a provision of appeal to the supreme court under section 379 of the crpc and also the um, convict can um, uh, apply for a special leave petition under article 136 of the constitution and this is a further safeguard against the any flaw or decision error you know which would might happen up until the high courts and lastly uh, the seventh point is that the president and the governor have the power to pardon right under articles um, 72 and 161 of the constitution respectively and this is the final safeguard now let's look at the constitutionality of the death penalty in the indian law firstly um, it has been debated many times in the parliament uh that you know even a bill was introduced at one point that the uh, death penalty is brutal it's inhuman and so it should be you know abolished but in the reports of the law commission they upheld the retention they said that they were in favor of the retention of the death penalty and they gave five reasons for that first of all that it was an effective deterrent and human beings uh, fear death secondly this penalty is uh, it is different from life imprisonment and uh, it is not just different in you know in degree but also in quality the third point is that um, the capital punishment uh, has many advantages which other punish forms of punishment do not the fourth point is that uh, there's some element of retribution that is there in death penalty which is um, often essential and crucial in order to keep the public peace and the fifth point is that the general consensus among judges and criminal lawyers and um, lawyers and criminal law administrators that um, death penalty um, owing to the heinous crimes that happened in india death penalty should be retained so next the constitutionality of death penalty i said earlier that uh, in the case of bachchan singh um, 
the court had held that uh, death penalty is to be used only in the rarest of the rare cases it has to be invoked only in the rarest of the rare cases and that is followed uh, till today so there was this uh, argument in uh, there was this case mithu versus state of punjab in this case see there was the section uh, 303 of ipc right that uh, uh, murder uh, when a murder is committed by a person who is already convicted for murder who will be awarded with death penalty and there was no other option it was argued that it is violative of uh, the articles 14 the 19 and uh, 21 of the constitution of india and the supreme court uh, said that it was they held that um, section 303 of the IPC was violative of the constitution and that it was very different from section 302 which awarded the um, punishment for uh, murder right and the reasons for that firstly in section 303 there was uh, there is no other um, you know alternative to death penalty and it was held in Bachchan Singh and uh, it has been agreed upon that death penalty should only be the alternative it cannot be the only punishment right and in 302 death penalty is not the only punishment it is the alternative punishment but in 303 it was the only punishment death penalty was the only uh, possible outcome the second point is that um, uh, according to section 354 uh, subsection 3 right of the CRPC where um, a person who is uh, facing the death penalty uh, when the court is awarding the death penalty has they have to give special reasons and the scope is simply not there in section 303 because uh, well how will they give special reasons when the death the only punishment that can be given is that of the death penalty and there is no other alternative and uh, lastly according to uh, section uh, you know 235 subsection 2 of crpc um, again the person who, the person that is the convict um, he can appeal you know there's a pre-sentence hearing that uh, you know he should be awarded um, life imprisonment instead of death penalty again according to section 303 since there was no no alternative to death penalty again uh, the crpc provision is redundant in that case right so then it uh, let's talk about the what constitutes the rarest of the rare argument right okay before that another in uh, in according to the criminal amendment of 1993 section 364a where uh, you know uh, kidnapping for ransom was an offense that is that was made punishable by death penalty as an alternative and it was uh, the the legislative reason for this was that uh, often terrorists uh, they held uh, you know uh, citizens instant citizens for uh, they kidnapped them and held them for ransom which then and the ransom includes uh, you know, different um, demands from the government so uh, this was uh, the section was challenged in um, uh, Vikram Singh versus Union of India uh, reported in 2013 and um, here the Supreme Court uh, actually upheld the section saying that in the circumstances that this section was uh, brought this death penalty was given in this such in such a case uh, or added you know that penalty was added as an alternative is uh, to you know they ensure the safety of the citizens of innocent people and so obviously the court agreed that it has to be applied in the rarest of the rare cases but they upheld section 364a of ipc now coming to the rarest of the rare cases and what constitutes it see it it is basically um, it depends on on a case by case basis but the common elements that are there is let's say um, you know the 
murder that was committed was very heinous and brutal and it was a case of extreme depravity and uh, maybe uh, multiple people were murdered and it shakes the public conscience the judicial conscience you know all of these uh, points and uh, uh, the, uh, these were you know noted by the supreme court in various cases uh, including of course the bachchan singh case and, and there are you know uh, for instance let's say uh, the sushil murmu case and then uh, um, uh, deepak rai case right in all these cases then for example um, another point is that there was no provocation on the part of the victim or uh, let's say the victims they are innocent children or uh, help helpless women or you know old people and uh, the murder that has been committed was uh, you know it was premeditated and it was calculated it was cold blooded in these cases would when you know when all these elements are put together and that is when we see that the rarest of the rare um uh, you know explanation can be attached to it which and and uh, in this case uh, it qualifies for death penalty and um further um mitigating circumstances right because uh, let's say the uh, person who has been awarded the death penalty they have the ability to um, uh, make appeals and special leave petitions and even uh, presidential pardon petitions right uh, and uh, mercy petitions mercy petitions right and in these cases the mitigation of the uh, punishment or whether the death penalty should not be given and you know instead life imprisonment should be given or uh, further mitigated it depends on the circumstances of the criminal right it depends on the circumstances of the convict for example their age the mental state level of knowledge antecedents family backgrounds dependents you know or whether uh, or the other um, factors for example maybe the murder was it was committed in heat of the moment or maybe there was provocation and uh, maybe there was family feud and personal uh, property disputes or you know and and also inordinate delay in execution of death sentence which is the next topic which is the next broad topic that we have to address right so the delay in execution of death sentences see uh the delay in ordinate amount of sometimes what happens is there are 2 years 3 years 10 years 12 years of delay in uh, between the death sentence being awarded and uh the execution and this is a very inhuman way for the convict to live because even until even un until death the con convict does have the right to life and uh, life cannot be led with such a pressure hanging on you that maybe today and you know maybe today uh, the execution will happen or tomorrow and there is no certainty and you know it's just inhuman so owing to this uh, for the first time in uh, it was uh, addressed in fact for the first time it was not addressed the supreme court what they did was for the first time they said that prolonged delay in execution exceeding 2 years might be sufficient ground for mitigating the death sentence and this was held in uh, vathisaran versus state of tamil nadu reported in 1983 now um, this this judgment was overruled in trivenivian versus state of gujarat in Na, uh, reported in 1989 and it was said that there can be no fixed period of delay that can be specified to make a death sentence uh, to nullify a death sentence and you know to mitigate it so but the court did say at that point as well that uh, you know an inordinate amount of delay um, sh should be an important ground for commutation of the death sentence finally in shatrughan chauhan versus union of india reported in 2014 the supreme court three judge bench of supreme court 
in a landmark judgment upheld the Vasi uh, Vathiswaran case in a way that um, they did not, uh, you know, use a two-year uh, bracket, but uh, they said that if there is a prolonged delay in mercy petitions and um, extending from, you know, six to twelve years for no valid reason, then uh, death penalty should be mitigated. And accordingly, certain um, rules were laid out in this case you know guidelines that uh, for the effective governing procedure of filing mercy petitions and uh, for death convicts right so number one uh, the solitary uh, confinement prior to the rejection of the mercy petition by the president is unconstitutional and should not be adopted uh, meaning that uh, before a mercy petition is rejected you, sh you cannot keep the person in solitary confinement Simple. number two even after rejection of the mercy petition the convict can <coughs> approach a writ court for the commutation of uh, death sentence and challenge the rejection of the mercy petition and in this stage the legal aid should be provided by the state right? the third point is that when uh, the mercy petition is received or communicated by the state government uh, after rejection by the governor the necessary materials the you know the police records the judgment trial uh, a court and uh, you know the judgment of the high court and if uh, applicable in the supreme court and all the connected documents everything should be called at once and uh, a time limit uh, should be fixed to forward the same to the uh, mha which is the ministry of home affairs Number four is the rejection of the mercy petition by the president or the governor should be communicated to the convict and his family in writing and it should be done immediately. The fifth point is that um, death convicts, they have the right to receive a copy of the rejection of their mercy petition. Number six is uh, a necessary minimum period of 14 days has to be stipulated between the communication of rejection of the mercy petition and the scheduled date of execution so that 14 day window should be there for um, this person to you know um, like it had it was said previously right that they can even file a writ against the mercy petition uh, against a rejected mercy petition so that time has to be given the seventh point is that uh, regular mental health evaluation of the death row convicts and appropriate medical care for those in need um, should be given. Uh, the eighth point is that the relevant documents uh, should be furnished to the prisoner within one week by the prison authorities to assist the mercy petitions and other petitions. Number nine is the prison authorities should facilitate and allow a final meeting between the prisoner and his family and friends prior to the execution and finally a compulsory post-mortem report is to be conducted on death convicts after the execution right finally if uh, we are to conclude this lecture and uh, you know questions are often asked that you know give your opinion on whether death penalty should be abolished whether it should be retained and the answer to that especially in the Indian context is even today there are many crimes that are so depraved in nature that you know they keep happening all the time in such cases the Indian society is not at a stage where we can completely abolish the death penalty it has to be there as an alternative you know as long as um, the mentality uh, that led leads to these crimes being committed is still there and uh, maybe we can at some point reach a day where you know death penalty can be abolished but until then uh, in previously when i was talking about france i did mention that uh, you know they have this uh, this reason that they give that people are not afraid of the death penalty but they're afraid of police efficiency so in india mostly seen as inefficient right the police in india is often seen as inefficient so 
the efficiency of the police obviously it has to be increased and uh, i think the final um, point when it comes to reduction of crime as a whole several factors are included in it right for instance uh, education and by education i don't mean just literacy because there are people who are literate and still commit heinous crimes so i mean education education poverty employment all of these factors they you know contribute to crimes in the society and uh, if these core factors can be tackled then we might you know have a day when we don't need the death penalty anymore until then uh, it is necessary it is a necessary as an alternative in, you know for the rarest of the rare cases thank you